only mode. Hello, active traders, and welcome to Options, Indicators, and Breakouts with Larry McMillan and myself, Ken Calhoun. Now, Larry, it's great to have you here today. It's been a, it's quite an honor to work with you. Thanks for having me, Ken. Hey, uh, as always, all information is for educational or information use only. We're not making advice about what to buy, sell, or hold. I've known Larry for years, and uh, we've always uh, talked about doing webinars together as we presented at the Traders Expos and so forth. So uh, let me go ahead and introduce Larry. Larry will do the first 30 minutes, and then I'll pick up the second 30 minutes. This is being recorded. A quick request, since we have so many people here, it's uh, one of the best attended webinars I've done this year. We have over 740 of you registered. Unfortunately, we will not have time for trader Q&A. If we had even a fraction of you ask questions, we'd be here all night. So we do ask that you hold questions for another time. But uh, certainly, it's a real honor to be here with Larry. Professional trader Larry McMillan is perhaps best known as the author of Options as a Strategic Investment, the best-selling work on stock and index option strategies, which has sold over 300,000 copies, which is amazing for a trading book. It's one of the records in the industry. He's a recipient of the prestigious CBOE Sullivan Award, as well as an inductee into the Traders Hall of Fame. Larry's been featured in multiple publications and events throughout the country and Europe, and he and I became friends presenting at multiple money shows over the years. So. Uh, it's a real honor to be here, Larry. I know we've talked for years about doing one of these, and I'm pleased to see you here. So I'm turning presenter control over to you, and take it away. All right, great. Thanks a lot, Ken. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, in just a short time here, we're going to try to uh, – I'm going to go over some of the option-oriented indicators that I use. Uh, just a little bit about our firm. Uh, when I first started this firm 25 years ago, we um, were mostly a research firm doing recommendations and newsletters, but in recent years we've moved into money management. So we now have a pretty active money management uh, arm, and we're, we're, we trade individual accounts. We have over 100 accounts open right now, and we also do a certain amount of option education, seminars like this, and we have um, mentoring. The um, this is the uh, URL where you can find the PDF of this presentation. I'm not sure it's up there yet, but it'll be up there uh, shortly. And there will also be some discounts for our products there and things. So uh, when I'm looking at the market, I look at four main things. Uh, the first is the chart of the S&P index. That's the most obvious, I guess. Uh, then equity-only put call ratios, market breadth, and the volatility indices. So we're going to try to cover these in a you know, short period of time here. Um, one thing I want to stress, and this is actually coming up right now, the, the market is overbought. I mean, we've gone up, we've broken out to new highs, we've been pretty much straight up since Brexit day two, and um, you know, there's just been a lot of buying. So a lot of times you'll hear it on TV as, as well. There's people say, "Oh, the market's overbought, so we need to sell it." Overbought does not mean sell. In fact, overbought means probably that a market has great momentum and is really rocketing to the upside. So you really wouldn't want to sell until the overbought condition ends. Uh, and so overbought markets can continue to rise for some time, and um, I'll, when I get a little more into the breadth indicators, I'll talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> oversold, on, you know, conversely, oversold does not mean buy either, but we're not in an oversold market right now, so we're not really too concerned about that. So this is the current chart of the S&P 500, and it's got the standard thing on it here, you know, support here at 2040. The old resistance uh, with the old highs 20, 20, uh, 1, 20 up to 2135, and then we've broken out to new highs. But um, there's these wavy lines on the chart here, and these, while not exactly option oriented indicators, are based on some option uh, uh, calculations. These are what I call modified Bollinger Bands. Now, um, I know John Bollinger fairly well, and when he invented Bollinger Bands, he defined volatility as the standard deviation of closing prices. And that seems quite logical. That sounds good to me. But mathematicians, uh, especially Black and Scholes, who invented the Black-Scholes model, use a different definition of volatility. Their definition is the standard deviation of closing price percentage changes. So it's a slightly different thing. And so that's what I use, because in all of our option models and everything, we, we have to stay consistent with the Black-Scholes definition of volatility. Otherwise, our implied volatilities wouldn't line up with historic volatilities, and it would just be a big mess. So this is the minus 4. The lower line here is the minus 4 standard deviation implied volatility. 
and the uh, so that's minus four uh, sigmas, and the other line is minus three. So it's a very simple system. When the S&P moves below the minus four, as it did here the day before Brexit, or the second day of Brexit, I guess, right there, and then closes back above the minus three, that's a buy signal. So that buy signal occurred on June 28th. You can see back here we had one uh, in January, and uh, I'm sorry, back here in January. Uh, that time there was a retest of the lows before we moved substantially higher, and then there was another one last uh, August, September. Again, a, a retest of the lows before we moved higher. This time there was no retest; we just rocketed off to the upside. Now the targets for these buy signals are the upper band, so you can see that the buy signal last <coughs> uh, in last uh, September resulted in a move all the way up and eventually a sell signal, which works you know, in a similar manner, all the way up here. Uh, the one we had in February never really got up to plus, uh, the plus four signal, but it bumped along the plus three signal line. Right now, the plus three signal line is at 2170, and the uh, higher plus four signal line is at 2195 right now. <coughs> So those are our near-term targets, at least uh, for this signal. <clears throat> um, this is just a broader picture. You can see that the bands, this is on the 11th, but they've moved a little higher in the last couple of days, and more like moving up like that. So uh, we're, we're targeting that, that at least for, as a minimum. And if the market starts to rise faster, those bands will rise as well. So um, you know they, they can move. They're not a fixed target. Okay, so you know, as far as the S&P chart goes, it's positive. We broke out to new highs. There's no resistance overhead, in fact, because we've never been at these levels. So, you know, something like a target of the modified Bollinger Bands is a reasonable uh, thing to use as a target. If there is a pullback, I, I would expect it to hold at the old highs at 2120 to 2135 in that range. And <clears throat> overall, it's just bullish. You know, this this indicator is bullish and. Actually, so are all of our others, as, as you'll see as we go along. So let's move into an option-oriented indicator here, and, and this is put-call ratios. Now, I use the equity-only put-call ratios, which means all stock options that trade. And uh, stock options are, uh, you know, in general, more, more uh, calls trade than puts. It's just a way of life. Index options, not so much, but stock options, that's, that's true. Um, and this is a contrary indicator. So if too many people are buying puts, then we want to think bullishly and buy the market. On conversely, if too many people are buying calls, then <clears throat> again we want to think conversely and be act bearishly to sell the market. <coughs> Excuse me. So the put call ratio was invented by <coughs> Marty Zweig back in the late uh, 1950s. And uh, he, in those days, he took the volume of the options out of uh, Barron's ads on Sundays from the put call uh, dealers. But now we've got computers, so uh, it's pretty simple. If we have the, uh, if we let's say take IBM, we sum up at the end of the day, we sum up all the puts that traded, and separately we sum up the volume of all the calls that traded. We divide the two. That's the put call ratio. So uh, I'm not sure why Marty didn't use the call put ratio, but since the put call it's a put call ratio it moves <clears throat> inversely to the market. In other words, since put buying is in the numerator of this fraction, heavy heavy market action on the downside creating put buying will actually make this ratio go higher. And conversely, calls are in the denominator, so heavy call buying in a bullish market will make this ratio go lower. I, uh, I use a moving average just to smooth it out. You need to smooth it out somehow. I, I use 21 days just in case there's something to Fibonacci. And you would normally ideally have an inverse kind of picture like this. So as the stock price is, is the red line on top there is moving along, the uh, put call ratio on the bottom here would be moving inversely. And <clears throat> if you look at a put call ratio chart, which we post about 400 on our website every day, um, you may find that you'll find some that don't have this mirror image. In that case, I would not trade that item because something else is going on, perhaps arbitrage, takeovers, other things like that. <coughs> so uh, this is not the current chart of SPX, but this is the equity and only put call ratio on the bottom, chart of SPX on the top, and you can see for the most part 
they do move inversely. So it is a useful indicator. Here's the current chart of the equity only put call ratio, and this one I, is the standard ratio, I call it, and that means we're using just the volume of the options. So when we rise up like this and everybody's uh, buying uh, puts and the market is collapsing like it was last January and February, eventually the put call ratio rolls over and starts to fall again. It's like the put buyers have gotten exhausted. That's a buy signal for the stock market. You can see it was a very good buy signal. Uh, we've kind of oscillated a little bit since then. We had a sell in late April, quickly came back to a buy in May, and now just recently, again, uh, last week, we had another buy signal. So again, this last leg up here in the market, which is this, day, this chart is current a couple of days ago, uh, is accompanied by a buy signal from the equity-only put-call ratio. Now, you know, since computers came along, we could do a little more sophisticated calculation here, and we can calculate what's called the weighted put-call ratio. In this case, we're going to look at the dollars being spent on uh, options. So let's say at the end of the day, we take any IBM option, we take its closing price, and we multiply it by the volume that traded that day. So now we have the amount of dollars that were spent on that option. And we do that for each of the IBM options, and then at the end of the day, we sum it up for the puts, um, and then we separately sum it up for the calls and divide the two, and that's the weighted put call ratio. So now I think this is actually better because now we're, we're, we're actually measuring the dollar spent on bearish or bullish opinion. Here's the current equity only uh, weighted ratio, and it doesn't look a whole lot different than the other one, but it, it is smoother in the most cases. And you can see that there was you know, a nice buy signal again back in February there, also a, a good one. Uh, last September, just just before the bottom, a little bit early, and now this last move upward here has been accompanied by again another buy signal. So the, both of these are on on buy signals. <laughs> now there's another ratio. Uh, well, I'm just some of these, I guess. So both gave buy signals recently. Uh, they weren't as high. You know, so I'm just going to back up a second. You can see these these signals we had last September and last February were at a very high ratio. In fact, 160 on the scale here on the left means $160 are being spent on puts for every $100 being spent on calls. So that's a, that's quite a bit when you're looking at all millions and millions of options that trade. Uh, the, this current buy signal came at a much lower level. It doesn't mean that it can't be a successful buy signal, but it's just, you know, not, the market was not as oversold, obviously, this last time around after Brexit as it was back after those bigger declines last August and last January and February. <clears throat> so, anyways, both are in bullish status right now. Now, um, the you might say, well, you know, it's easy to go back and put those buys and sells on the chart after they've occurred. But we use a computer analysis program that works kind of like a chess playing tree, and pays attention to uh, what's coming off the moving average and what's coming on. So we're we can get a pretty good handle in advance. Uh, or quickly, anyway, when the thing turns as to uh, whether it's really going to roll over or not. So usually we don't have to wait like 10 days or something to see the a buy signals occur. We'll catch it on maybe the first or second day that that average actually rolled over. <clears throat> now another rate to watch is the total put call ratio. This is all stock options and all index options, not futures, but stock and index options that trade. This rarely gives a signal, and maybe you know, once or twice a year. Um, but when it does, they're very powerful. And in general, we look for at least a hundred point rise in the S&P 500 when these signals occur. Uh, the last one occurred on June 2nd, and it's still in effect right now. And the target for that signal is 2205 on, S, uh, on the SPX. Here's a, just a, a recent chart of the last couple of years. Um, the red, and most of my charts, as you'll see later, my system signals, if they're red, that's a successful signal. If they're blue, it's not. If they're green, it's still in operation. So we had a very successful uh, signal in September of 2014 uh, over here on the left side of the chart. And then we had another strong one uh, last September, at, you know, where we saw those other buy signals from put call ratios and things. And we had one in February. And then we had one on again on June 2nd. Now we did fall back from there, but uh, we're now moving higher, and so the target is still in effect. These numbers down here in the bottom, we had two that were stopped out here. I, I don't have time to go over all the rules, but 
if you're a subscriber to our newsletters, we explain these systems fully. They're not secrets or anything. So this first one here did make the 100 points. This, this one here lost 18 points. This one only lost two. And this made the 100 points, and this one made the 100 points. So hopefully we'll see this one making 100 points as well. Uh, I think going back to about the year 2000, there's been, uh, uh, I believe, uh, 24 signals, and uh, 16 of them have been profitable. But on average, the uh, signals produce about 70% gain, even including the losses. <coughs> So um, let's move on to market breadth. Now this is not an option or an indicator uh, really, but I, it's something I think is, uh, you, you know, he, it's, well, it's good for you to pay attention to. Breadth is the advances minus declines every day, and we keep a cumulative total of that, uh, and we keep an oscillator. My oscillator is this. We take 90% of yesterday's value, and they add 10% of today's advances minus declines. So in order to keep this yourself at home, you'd need the starting value, yesterday's value. So I'm going to show my email address what's well, there at the bottom of the screen, info at optionstrategies.com. If you want to, want to keep this yourself, just shoot me an email and I'll send you back the starting value and then you can keep it yourself going forward. Um, <clears throat> there's two kinds of breadth, though. One is the New York Stock Exchange breadth. And that has a problem because a lot of things in the New York Stock Exchange are not stocks. So we keep a stocks only breadth where we look at just stocks that are optional, that have options trading on them. And so you can see here that uh, in, when it climbs above, the, at least by my definition, when it climbs above 200 here, uh, that makes it an overbought. And when it falls below minus 400, it's oversold. So we, were, we just barely touched an oversold condition in Brexit gave us a buy signal, there was another tiny one. There are bigger buy signals back here. Now when you go into an oversold, overbought condition, the buy signal occurs when you come out of it. As I said earlier, while the market is overbought, we don't want to sell it. It's just when it stops being overbought that we want to sell. So right now, this today moved up to here, the second highest reading ever, in the, and I take this thing back to real, you know, into the 1990s, the second highest reading ever. So you might say, wow, that's really overbought. I better sell this market. But no, look, here was the highest reading ever. That was March 7th. That was right here, just coming out of the We went much higher. It didn't really give a sell signal until over here, right there. So again, overbought does not mean sell. So in an overbought situation like this with the market breaking out to new highs, I think it's possible this market has a lot of momentum. <coughs> so. As long as they, these indicators remain overbought, uh, you know we're, we're considered them uh, on buy signals, uh, no matter how overbought they get. So now let's talk about VIX, because this is the you know everybody th thinks they know about VIX. I find from watching people on television that most, uh, hardly anybody really understands VIX. But I'm not going to get into the whole complicated VIX futures and term structure and all that stuff here. I'm just going to show you a couple of quick systems that you can use by watching the VIX indicators, and you'll see that they're, they can be very profitable for you. So uh, one of the things that we look at as far as determining market direction is what is the trend of VIX. So VIX generally will trend opposite to the market. So if the market is falling sharply, VIX is rising. On the other hand, if the market is rising, VIX is falling or at least going sideways or you know, not certainly not rising. So that's one important thing, the trend of VIX. Uh, but there's other things we look for. Uh, one is spike peak buy signals. I'm going to show you a chart of these in a minute. The last one we had was on June 27th. <clears throat> the second day of Brexit actually was a down day in the market, but VIX collapsed that day near the end of the day and gave us a buy signal and I'll show you how, how that works. Um, <clears throat> but right now, VIX is quite low. Uh, again, that's an overbought state, but again, it's not a sell signal because VIX can stay low. If VIX is 13 now, and that's about as low as it's been in the last couple of years, but it, it has gone down 12, 11, 10 before. So <laughs> um, just to say that VIX is low does not mean you should be selling the market. So here's the current VIX chart. And these are the VIX spike peak buy signals marked on the chart. So you can see here during Brexit, it shot up to almost 27 that day, and then later that day it closed here, 
and that actually gave us a buy signal because by that time it had reversed all the way back down more than three points. That's a, that's our we need a reversal of more than three points to give us a buy signal. And you can see we had one, you know, back that last August at the bottom. That one came right after that big hundred point down day. That followed quickly by another one the next week, followed by another one in late September on the retest, and again in January near that bottom in February on the retest. And the blue ones. There, yes, there were some losing signals in there as well, but the the ones that were really caught the the bottom, you you made a lot of money on those. And we trade options with these. We don't we don't trade the index itself, so that our risk is known and and limited by buying call options. <coughs> Excuse me. So I had mentioned the trading range. You can see here, VIX has been in a trading range between 13 and 17. It's now back near the bottom of the range, and you can see it's bumped around, but, but but you know last year, uh, while it was rising, it, it was while well, the market was rising before it collapsed in August, VIX got all the way down near 11. So to say that you know just because VIX is near the bottom of this range or it's at 13 or whatever, to say that that's a sell signal, it, it really isn't. And you can see here that VIX actually started to trend higher before Brexit. But as soon as uh, Brexit occurred, VIX reversed back downward and gave that buy signal. Now, you know, at certain times in the past, VIX has kept on going higher. You know, in the 2008, 2011. So, you know, you then the trend is up, and you wouldn't you wouldn't fight that trend until you got that sharp reversal back downwards, and that's your buy signal. So, again, um, you know, there are, there are more rules to this system that I really have time to talk about here, but uh, we do explain them all in our newsletters when, when these signals occur. So there's more to uh, the volatility indicators, though, than, than just VIX. But for right now, VIX is trendless, so that's bullish. It's not trending upwards. If it starts to trend higher, so, you know, the 20-day moving hour starts to rise, and VIX is rising up above 17 breaks out of that range again, then that, that would be bearish. But as long as it's in this 13 to 17 range, I'm treating VIX as benign at, at worst, and so stocks can rise while VIX is in a flat to down range. Um, well, as I said, close above 17 would be bearish. And as I said, also at 13 it's overbought, but not a sell signal. So uh, that spike peak buy signal occurred on June the 27th. They last for a month, if not stopped out. They get stopped out if VIX goes back to a new high. So we're only about halfway there. So this this buy signal has another couple of weeks to run. And you know, admittedly, I've determined that you know it lasts for about a month through uh, back testing, which is not necessarily. Uh, I wouldn't say it's optimized. I really don't like optimization because that just you know that fits your your system exactly to what happened in the past, but you don't know how it's going to work in the future. But uh, holding for about a month has is, is, has been pretty profitable, and, I, and we we already rolled our calls up. So if you if you own calls and the market is going your way, uh, then a, a good way to, to take some money out but still keep a, a bullish position is to roll your call up to a higher strike. And so we we did that uh, well this week. <clears throat> But now there's a couple of other indices. The CBOE actually publishes four indices. They publish uh, a short-term one called the VST, which is a, a based on a, a, a nine-day volatility forecast. VIX is a 30-day volatility forecast. Then there's VXV, which is the 90, I believe, 91-day volatility forecast, and then VXMT, medium term which is a 183-day volatility forecast. So the CBOE publishes these four indices at all times during the trading day. And uh, VIX itself actually is now published beginning at 3.30 in the morning to bring in some of the European trading. The others are not, uh, they don't start publishing those until the CBO opens at you know 9.30 Eastern time. <clears throat> but the uh, you should, you if, if you can quote VIX on your machine, you can quote the rest of these. I, on the, I'm using eSignal most of the time, and eSignal uses a dollar sign in front of an index, so that's why I use these dollar signs here. And so in my nomenclature, all indices have a dollar sign in front of them. But however, <coughs> however you quote indices on your trading system, uh, you can quote all four of these. So in normal times, VIX is less than VXST. In other words, the 30-day volatility 
is less than a 91 day volatility and you know that's that's fine that's the way things should be but occasionally when the market gets hit pretty hard VIX will jump up so fast that it rises above VXV that is an oversold condition but again oversold is not buy so we wait and when it comes back below it again so it goes first has to go above it and then the you wait for these are all closing prices. When it closes below it, that's your buy signal. So we had a buy signal from this indicator on June the 28th, <coughs> the first day out of or after Brexit. Uh, we've already taken our profits on this one. This is a short-term system, and it it has it calculates its or not calculates it gets its best profits in the first five trading days. It's still profitable, probably even more profitable to hold for a month. But there is some, there can be some flaky times in there, and really, it's it's a short-term kind of thing. So um, that that's the way we use this system. But there's another one that is also, uh, well, I'm sorry. Here, so I have a couple of charts here. So this goes all the way back to 2014. So those solid red lines mark bars on the chart where this these buy signals occurred. So you can see, I mean, some of them were tremendous, like the one the first one over here in October of uh, 2014 the market just roared straight higher uh, for five days coming out of that one Th this one was pretty good too signal occurred right there on that day and then we had a big big rise right after that you know some not so much I mean this one it, you got a rise and and th this was actually a double here the first one didn't work you get you stop out you know it, it, you stop yourself out of v if VIX goes back and closes above VXV of course, you're going to come back in. We had a few of them there in uh, September of that year. Then <coughs> late last fall, after the big decline in August, we had a couple in September that were okay. You know, the market did rise. This one was not a good one. But this one was excellent the, coming out of the bottom. You know, again, okay there, not too good there. But then a very, you know, good one there, a really excellent one there. And then the net, that's the last one before the one we just had here on June 27th. So it hasn't been one for like four months until the one we just had in June. Now, <clears throat> I also mentioned VXST. That's the shortest, ter shortest term volatility index, the nine day. So it flies around like mad. And when the market gets hit, like it did at Brexit, <coughs> VIX will rise above all those other ones, above VIX. And VXSC will rise above VIX, it'll rise above VXV, and it'll rise above VXMT. So it's, it's above, if it's above all three of those, then by this definition, the market is oversold. And again, we wait. We don't do anything until VIX at least VXSC at least closes below one of them. It did that on June 28th. That was a buy signal. These have a little more lasting ability, so we're still in this trade, and we have rolled the calls up. Uh, Based on that one, so uh, again, these these VIX, uh, the CBOE volatility indices are very valuable in terms of you know how you want to trade the market uh, on a short term, and they, they give you signals. And you know, I mean, you hear on TV like, oh, who knew that the market was going to go up after Brexit? Well, I didn't know, but I had these. You see, we had three buy signals. We had VIX. We had the VX, uh, VX crossover, we had the VIX spike peak, and we had the VXST crossover. Three buy signals there, plus the fact <coughs> we already had a, uh, uh, and plus that we also got a, a Bollinger Band, a modified Bollinger Band buy signal. So, you know, I can't say that I knew the market was going to new highs, but I, I did buy the market heavily, you know, on the second day uh, coming out of Brexit. So, um, you know, that's why I like technical analysis or system trading because you just you don't have to guess because if you had to guess after Brexit you would have made a bad guess you would have guessed the market was going to have trouble or go down it certainly seemed like it should have but it didn't anyway so uh, the volatility conclusion is bullish VIX is trending sideways that's bullish we've got these three buy signals in place only a VIX close above 17 would change my opinion on this so just to summarize, and I'm coming to the end of my half hour here, uh, this is my current market status as of today. The SPX chart is bullish. The put call ratios on buy signals, they're bullish. The breadth oscillators, deeply overbought, but on buy signals, and we like them to be overbought when we're breaking out to new highs like this. Um, <clears throat> VIX itself bullish because it's trending turn, down to sideways. And the volatility index buy signals, those those are all in effect. 
And so the only conclusion that I can say here is stay with the trend because I don't have any sell signals. And the only thing I have is some overbought conditions, but overbought does not mean sell. So uh, we're staying you know, long here and uh, just the way it is. I uh, Again, our, uh, the PDF of this presentation will be posted up there. There's some discounts on that page, <laughs> discounts on our products. That's my contact information, my email right here. Uh, if you want to ask me any questions, Ken said, you know, we don't really have time tonight for questions. So if you have one, shoot me a question. And if you want to get that oscillator value to get yourself started uh, tracking that, you can uh, just email me and I'll send you back to starting value. All right, Ken, I got 829. I made I made my time exactly. Hey, well done, Larry. Thanks so much. Hey, I picked up quite a bit. I like to put call ratio explanation and also how to use the VIX the right way. So, thanks for clearing that up. It's a, you're a brilliant guy, and I am always blown away by your technical analysis. I like watching you at the money show events and all that. So, uh, thanks so much, Larry McMillan from Option Strategist, one of the world's foremost, not the top options guy in the entire universe. So, highly recommend. Uh, Larry McMillan at optionstrategist.com. And uh, thanks, Larry. Really appreciate it. That was a great presentation. All right, Ken. Glad, glad you had me. Thank you. Thanks. So we will turn over to me at this point in time. Can everybody let me know if you can see the uh, the screen cap here of Larry and me speaking at the Traders Expo in New York? This was year before last. Is it coming through fine? And can you see everything? Uh, stick around, too, because Larry will be back with us toward the end of the half hour that I've got to present. I'm going to be looking at our current charts, and the main thing I want you to get from my presentation tonight is how to figure out your strike price the right way by being able to visually scan for the very strongest breakout charts. That's my expertise is I'm a professional breakout trader, and as you're looking for developing a trading plan where your options actually hit the strike price before expiration, one of the things that I think can really help facilitate your progress is to understand the difference between the strongest charts and everything else out there. So we're gonna look at these on both the 90 day, these are my favorite 90 day charts by the way, NVIDIA, SEMO, SKT, AU, they're buying up silver and gold, so we've got instruments moving up nicely in those patterns as well, and we're gonna get underway here. Now I don't know how many times you've been in the situation where uh, your options expire worthless, but that's uh, quite frustrating, right? And one of the things that I want you to do is Whenever you're looking over your options chains to pick your strike price and your expiration and your premium, I want you to figure out which charts are actually likely to hit your strike price. And the benefit of that is, you know, if you're looking at the strongest breakout charts that are most likely to continue, you can buy even further out of the money options on uh, buying your calls to get in cheaper and you get a higher probability of them hitting your strikes by getting in correctly on the front end. So we're going to look at those charts and how to do that in the next 27 minutes. The force is strong with this one. Anyways, uh, great to see all of you here on tonight's Shindig. We got, I live in Colorado now, so I can say words like Shindig. We got 746 of you registered tonight, so an epic turnout. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm former UCLA, well, I'm a UCLA grad, a former quality engineer statistician for Ford. Uh, you may have seen my Trade Mastery Live events, complete with showgirls in Las Vegas. You may have seen me in this month's issue of Stocks and Commodities, or all year long I do a regular trading on momentum breakout column. Uh, I've been featured in CBS Market Watch 15 years ago, back before the dawn of time. And I've been all over the place. And this is kind of it for my PowerPoint. So I'm gonna spend the entire presentation looking at today's charts. Main thing I want you to get is how to find strong breakouts. So again, as you're looking over your options chains to pick your strike price and expiration and premium that makes sense for your, your trading plan, you're able to scan visually through those charts that are most likely to continue and avoid false breakouts. Because if you get into a, a directional, let's say you're doing a directional, you're buying a, a call and uh, you get into it and you do it based on a, a chart that looks like it's going up, but there's some hidden signals that lead to a false breakout, your options can expire worthless and you're, you're gonna lose money. So what you wanna do is look for the strongest high velocity charts and how to visually tell the difference between those instantly uh, between what you've been trading that is expired worthless and not doing well for you and everything else. My expertise is in breakouts. I'm one of the top go-to guys for breakout trades. So let's take a look at these charts and what makes them appealing. One of the patterns that I speak on in my money show appearances and I publish in stocks and commodities is what I call an acceleration ramp. 
Now, the important point, and that's where you go from a steady uptrend to a sharper, preferably higher volume, 45 degree angle breakout. Now, the reason I mention this is that you really need to better understand implied volatility using not only historical volatility to forecast price action, but more importantly, when it's getting hotter, when you've got an increase or a spike in implied volatility by knowing which breakout patterns will move price the best and the, the trick is, and are most likely co to continue up to hit your strike so you can pick the right strike price ahead of time. So if you're trading something that looks like it's going up and then it never does hit your strike, the reason is you're, you're not looking at the right types of charts that have increased in recent volatility. So my favorite number one trades are always window or gap continuations like we saw in Seagate yesterday. I don't know who else is trading Seagate, but I'm a big fan of gap continuations. Now, hopefully you have not been making rookie options mistakes 101, like buying your call or put options or selling them right ahead of earnings release to try and hit a home run because that's gambling. You know who you are. How many of you have done that? You bought your, your call option right ahead of earnings and hope you get it right. Well, that's great if it works, but if it gapped down, it would expire worthless, right? So one of the things you want to do as an options trader is develop a reactive plan that gets into strong, high-velocity, implied volatility instruments that are likely to continue. So now we're good to go. Seagate, you might want to buy a call up in the up in the region up here, up at 33.35, uh, out with a reasonable expiration date with a continuation pattern that's going to work. OK, my traders for years have been asking me for help with options and uh, thought I would launch that with the uh, working here with uh, Larry so that you can look at charts that work out. Now, look at GDX. It's historically been one of my favorite charts for trading the underlying for trading gold miners, right? Or junior miners and gold mining stocks have been on quite the run lately. However, this would be a really stupid instrument to buy a call option. in. now, having said that, watch it run to 40, right? You blaze this through a strike. But the point is. We're in a congestion region, so I see no sign of strength coming into that instrument. And in fact, if you, I'll bet, I haven't pulled this up, but I'll bet if you pull up an ADX, you will see that it's probably going down, right? The ADX is down here. If you look at the red ADX signal line and it's in a decline, that's a function of, or telling you've got a congestion box and it's not likely to continue up. So you don't want to buy call options. And again, I know there's many more exotic ways to trade options, but Let's just start with simply buying calls or selling puts. If you're looking at a directional option trade, uh, you don't want to trade something that has a history of recent congestion. You want to instead focus on rockstar charts that are in a increasing uptrend, not just a steady uptrend. CTL is good. Okay, it's a nice steady uptrend. Applied materials, however, is better because of the increase in velocity. So many of my institutional clients over the years, I've had so many of the Wall Street guys come to my Las Vegas and Denver and other and California seminars I've done. I've trained people around the world, and one of the things that separates out the best and the brightest and the most profitable professional traders is the keen sense of increasing volatility in trading the hottest instruments. And in street talk, they say those are in play, right? And there's a lot of colorful, not G-rated phrases we could also use, but I'll I will keep this a family-friendly event. But anyway, if you ever talk to professional traders and you get into the thinking behind the very strongest directional trades, you're going to see that there's a clear and distinct difference between good charts and those that aren't. Now, speaking of the VIX, uh, if you're trading directional options, or for me, I will trade the underlying. I trade XIV for directional going long with the market and VXX for the short, which are driv derivatives off the, the VIX. I'll go long. The XIV is how I trade the stock market long, and I'll go long the VXX inverse to trade the market short if I believe the market's going down. What I don't like about XIV is the fact that it's just in a steady uptrend. I'd prefer to see an increased angle uptrend. So what you want, I mean, obviously you should only trade directional options and things that are in an uptrend because it's likely to hit a strike. But even better than that is going to be an acceleration ramp pattern where you've got a, not straight up, but a nice 45 degree angle breakout in the last several days of the week or so prior to putting on the trade. So for example, something like tasers, gotten zapped up to new highs, and that's good, but I don't like this chart for an op for a call option because it's in a net downtrend the last few days. And so you go back and forth. It's kind of like a love-hate relationship with your charts. You're figuring out which ones you want to love to get into the an options trade that makes sense, which breakouts are likely to continue, and the difference or the delta between those and everything else out there. These are all good charts to trade the underlying 
but not so much for your options because you need to have that extra push or that extra increase in volatility. Like TSS, I like because it did a bullish cup, a congestion, minor gap continuation, minor gap continuation, minor gap continuation, and there's four in a row. One of my recent articles on a break on multiple gap continuations, I believe it was last month's July issue of Stocks and Commodities Magazine, talked about the value. This is a rider down or two. I've traded millions of dollars worth of stocks and ETFs, over $6 million worth over the last 15, 16 years now. I know how to trade. One of the things you want to give preference to in directional option trading is, and breakout trading for the underlying for that matter, is trading instruments or giving preference, say if you're buying a call up here, for instruments that have a sequence of multiple gaps. That's kind of like a poker tell. The guy's eyes twitching, his, his uh, neck vein is, is moving, his eyes are dilating. He, he doesn't have it, so he's bluffing. Anyway, for a good breakout chart, what you're looking at is multiple gap continuations. And that's a sign that institutional buying pressure is so excited. And they can't wait. They're falling over themselves to get in. They'll bid it up pre-market. The spec, the specialist opens it up uh, higher to, to match the order flow, and we're off to the races. That's a good chart for directional option trade up here, TSS. DKS, also good because it's got a history of strong, not only historical volatility, but the, the IV on the breakout, we've got a multiple series of gaps and when you're looking at that you know this can become a very vital toolkit or a part of your your toolkit as a direction as an options trader because what you're looking for is instruments that are likely to hit a strike and you have a strike price uh within before the time decay eats it up and eats up the premium uh, premium and what you want to do is make sure that you're identifying those charts that are most likely to get directional continued buying into the strike and so and again your mileage might vary depending if you're selling puts, you're doing other uh, other options for options for options, but make sure that you're trading these charts. Now here's one that although at first blush, uh, Leonard looks okay, I would not do a trade in because it's been congesting and going down slightly the last several days. So it's less likely to continue up. Big picture, it looks fine. Technically it's still in an uptrend and hasn't lost support, which would be right here in our 47.80. But for that reason, I'd be out. QLD, which is one of our ETFs tied to the Qs, is directionally up, and that looks good for breakout continuation. Question, uh, say, don't, unfortunately, I don't have time for a Q&A because we have 746 of y'all, but um, I use 15, but I will just tell you, I use eSignal. Uh, I use 15-minute, 15 uh, 15-day charts, and I also use the daily chart, which we'll look at next for some of these. 90-day daily charts and 15-day, 15-minute charts with simple volume and price action. I'm a professional price action swing and intraday trader. And what I like to look for are charts that are most likely to continue up so it simplifies my approach to trading. Let me give you a couple of quick tips as a professional trader from one to another. A uh, quick tip, here's a flow chart that's free. You can download. You don't have to opt in or anything. But one of the things that will help you become more success, potentially become more successful as a trader is to scale and not throw all your contracts at a trade at once. You may want to split it into, say, 1% or 2% maximum capital allocation per trade, 2% max. But play the field. Play more instruments than you're currently playing and use tighter, uh, tighter entry criteria. So make sure that you're scaling. Maybe you're doing a sequence. As you're reviewing your options chain and you're really keen on being long Apple or something. And you, you want to develop a more segmented approach to trading. That's one of the biggest things that helped me turn the corner back in the early 2000s. After blowing up a couple of trading accounts, I finally made it. Cha-ching! And the way is, it's all about the math and not so much the chart patterns. The chart patterns are critical to get you in, but to manage your your exits and managing your, your multiple entries, you want to be able to do a, a very keen job of, you know, you know if I look at my biggest winning, this is just trading the underlying, but if I, you know, my $1,700 days where I'm up real money trade account, I'm looking at unrealized P&L and the underlying. One of the things that you want to do as a trader is trade a, a broader array of instruments, right? Make sure that you are trading a segment, excuse me, or a series of charts, not just a single Hail Mary pass and one that you fall in love with. The more experience you get as a trader, you'll realize that it's much more about playing the numbers. It's a numbers game. 
So acceleration ramp in progress here for ARRS. You can see steady uptrend followed by sharp angle breakout. So that's good for a directional play up here. MXL, not so good. I don't like this chart for a directional option trade. It may be fine for trading the underlying for a day or a swing trade, but not for an options trade because it has this history of doom and gloom down here and half-hearted congestion. You know, it's kind of like looking at him, hiring an employee and you're doing a reference check and yeah, like, yeah, they're dressed nice for the interview, but they have a history of absenteeism and they piss off the customers. So overall, the technical picture isn't bright. I mean, sure, if it takes out new highs, then it may be worth taking a look at. But overall, this is not nearly as good a chart as one with a sustainable uptrend like so many of these others, right? Like that's one of my favorite charts, SKT. That's a, it's a rock star chart or NVIDIA, or Applied Materials. Those are all superior charts to something that has a checkered past like this. So to avoid false breakouts and to set your options trades up in a way that's likely to hit a strike, avoid charts like this. Because, you know, I teach to thousands of traders, tens of thousands, that's great. Uh, probably not as many as Larry, but I'm getting there. And uh, one of the things that I've learned in both working with my institutional clients and professional Wall Street guys, as well as my retail traders that I have in my various services is many traders are overly optimistic. The better you get as a trader, the more cynical you become and the more discreet or discriminant in your uh, technical skills, the better you get to be a technician so that you, like Larry said, the market will show you the answers. Yeah, it's a breakout. It looks good, but it's not nearly as good, you know, from a time management standpoint as some of these others that have better breakout potential. So, Make sure that you're narrowing your focus as a professional trader to charts that are likely to work out. So one of the underlying messages I want to give you tonight is if you're losing money in your options trade, you're probably not trading charts like this. I mean, I'm a directional trend trader. So let's say I'm selling the puts or buying the calls on this, you know, for a, a, a strike up several points higher, a couple, a week or two out, whatever my, my play is or a month out, whatever my play is, uh, one of the things that I think can help you become a much, and I have so many options traders that have come to me for breakout trading training over the years because you really need to be able to get a keen sense of what's worth trading and what's not. And the better you get as a trader, the tighter you get and the more technically adept you get, like Larry and, and other market professionals. So make sure that if you are looking for a handful of instruments, number one, you don't just throw a Hail Mary pass. Hey, I really like their videos. Let me buy 30 contracts for no, don't do that. You want to be more discriminant and play the field. I mean, all the airlines have been up lately, for example. Another quick strategy, a strategic note for position sizing and multiple trade management is you may want to do your directional calls in a handful of, say, three or four instruments because you might miss it. I'm a big fan of 1960s TV. Specifically, I Dream of Genie, Wild Wild West, and Get Smart. And you might miss it by that much in one, and if you only traded American Airline, I don't know who else likes 1960s TV, but I kind of live in the 60s. I'm a jazz musician too, and I, I'm, I'm a 60s kind of guy. Anyway, I like Frank Sinatra, he's the best singer. And if you don't know who Frank Sinatra is, then go away. But anyway, so maybe we want to buy your call, say Delta, American, not four, not four A's, A-A-L, or United, or Hawaiian Airlines, or whatever you're trading, all right? You're trading the airline sector. One of the key takeaways that I want you to take from this is how to make money as a trader, uh, potentially how to make money as a trader. And one of the ways to do that, and this is true for underlying as well as doing your, your options, is make sure that you're trading several instruments. So maybe you're doing two or three contracts in each of. It's much smarter to do, say, two or three uh, call options, uh, buy two or three call options, get your strike price, your expirations, your premiums figured out for two or three instruments in a hot sector like airlines. You know, it had been gold. Before that, it had been oil, right? Who knows what's coming in? Before that, that last year, it had been pharmaceuticals and biotechs. Anyways, the correct is a professional options trader. One of the things that I think you will really benefit from is having a more discriminant, a more discreet kind of portfolio management approach in your directional options trade so that you're trading multiple instruments in a way that really makes sense. So, so instead, so don't just, you know, buy the call, you know, the three week out or month long, month out call in United, 
you know, with 10 contracts, you might want to do two contracts in each in several different instruments. That way you're diversifying your approach, and that way if you missed it by that much in one, you may still make it, may still hit the strike in two or three of the others. So that's why it's really important from a trading standpoint. I want to teach you to become more successful traders, and it's, again, a lot more about playing the numbers and playing the field. I'm knocking on a lot of doors, and maybe out of 10 doors, you know, five of them don't open, but three of them open up wide enough to make you a nice net profit, and the other two not so much. But if you only knocked on one or two door, one or two at a time, you're likely to run into a lot of failure. And that was me back in the 90s before I learned how to trade, because uh, I would throw Hail Mary passes and trade large size on just two or three favorites instead of playing a field of maybe eight or 10 different instruments. Is this chart good based on what I said? The answer would be no. I would not buy a call option up here because it's got a checkered past. It's got a scarlet letter A for those who are familiar. It's got all kinds of bad things going on. Now a newbie trader said, hey, but it's going up lately. Well, two days, but all the rest of the days we had what? One, two, three, four up days. The rest of these you know, candlestick charts reveal you know, all the red candle days we had here. It's a nice directional breakout trade, but I would not be doing a direct, uh, buying a call option in this or a series of call options in this because it's not as strong a chart. My goal is to help you become more successful as an options trader. And one of the things that will really help you facilitate that is to make sure that you're you're trading the strongest patterns. You know, you have to look at the impact of time decay too. It's relationship to price action and underlying to get at the fair value and pricing to help you develop a successful strategy. And a key fundamental thing that's missing in the life of a lot of the options traders that have come to me for trading over the years is they will pull, I will ask them, okay, show me your last three losing options trades. And they'll pull up charts that, I, you know, I bite my tongue and I'm polite. I've learned I'm 52 years old. How the heck did that happen? The UCLA graduate from 1986 and now all of a sudden I'm 52. But anyway, I digress. Uh, I used to be a statistician and quality engineer for the Ford Motor Company back in the early 90s. So I'm a quantitative guy. I'm a, I'm a numbers and a chart guy. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm much more polite now than I used to be and patient. I guess that comes with maturity and wisdom, but at least that's what they say. The point is, Traders will give me charts that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. I wouldn't trade in a million years because the implied volatility, not only the implied volatility, but the historical volatility of the chart is, is no good, and therefore it's not likely to work out. I'll be hard-pressed to find an example of a bad chart. I don't know. Let's pick a stupid penny stock like, I don't know, plug. Okay. Only a complete fool would trade something like that. Okay, so... Enough said all that. Let's look at charts that one actually would want to trade. NVIDIA, Rockstar, Gap Continuations. Gaps continue most of the time. Now, one of my favorite candlestick patterns, and I've worked really closely with my colleague Steve Nesson for 15 years now, and he's the expert in candlestick charts. And one of the things that I learned as a directional breakout trader is look for wide green candles as a early lead indicator for upcoming price action in your favor and trend following a market moving event, whether it's a pivot off a moving average or breakout or gap up to new highs, large candles are likely to do well. If you see a series of smaller candles like a shooting star or a doji or something that's flat and small and your spinning top or whatever, uh, it's a flat melted candles up here, that's not as good as getting in on say, so if you, my point is if you'd seen this pattern back here, you would know to, to buy your call option out whether it's a couple of weeks or whatever your time frame is, you know, set a strike price that makes sense based on the trading range. You know, use price projection to project out your strike price, right? And there's tools that can do that for you in the software. I would take them with a grain of salt because you need to have a good, savvy, keen sense of likelihood of continuation, not just price action. So you need to combine or integrate multiple variables like a wide range candle with high volume on a gap day is likely to attract new buyers afterwards, right? Another good chart on a 90 day here, SIMO. This is, I don't know who can remember, what's this pattern called? I used to teach MBA courses. 104 courses I taught even over like a six year time frame. Uh, so class, what's this called? That's an acceleration ramp, right? We got a steady uptrend with a nice 45 degree angle breakout. So that's a good candidate for directional buying a call options trade up here in the unexplored white uh, area on the right side of the chart because it's got good, uh, not only historical volatilities up, but the implied volatility is a function of the increase in recent price action and the breakout makes for a good options candidate up here.
I hope that all makes sense. If you've been losing money as a trader, it's because you're not trading charts that are strong enough. I've traded millions of dollars worth of stocks and ETFs. I had to trade. And I will tell you, based on my experience with thousands of traders and hundreds who've come to my live seminars, they ask me about charts that nobody, and I just kind of have to be really polite and bite my tongue, but I want to reach out and shake them and say, why the heck would you trade that instrument in the first place? It's a junk chart. Instead, you want to trade rock star charts, the outlier charts, kind of like the, uh, the outliers on a standard deviation curve with the, at the 95 and 99% sigma ranges on a bell-shaped curve. I won't get all statistical on y'all, but the point is trade the outliers. Trade charts that are characterized by large green candles. That's institutional kind of a tell, like a poker tell signal. But it's likely to get some buyers after that, whether you're trading the underlying or looking for developing an options plan based on figuring out the strike price, your expiration, what premium makes sense. As you look at the option chain, what, what I want you to hunt for visually, I'll tell you what to look for. I know how to trade. Look for a chart that goes like that, then pull up the options chain and see what it's telling you about the strike price, the expiration, the premium, the mix, what's available, price project. I don't have time to do price projections. We only got a few minutes left here, but does that all make sense? You're going to do yourself, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot as an options trader if you're trading you know, on charts whose underlying have low implied volatility, low historical volatility, and you're trying to go for a strike way up here. You're going to lose your money, son. So don't do that. Just say no. Instead, get in on the best directional trades. I'm a professional breakout trader. I know how to trade. You know, one of the things I want you to get at is do yourself a favor and visually look for th these tells, like large, big, multiple, two or three times the whole real body, average whole real body height of the previous week on increasing volume. This is a pattern I mentioned in one of my Stocks and Commodities magazine articles. you got a stair-step sequence of three increasing volume days with increasing price action, it's good to go. And that ran up three points, right? That was my buy signal at 38.50. And boom, flawless victory. It's off to the races, right? AU, gold and silver, precious metals have been up nicely lately, right? AU is up on a nice move up. And again, if you just kind of eyeball the chart, if you draw a center line like a DNA helix strand, what, what's the center line? You know, if you're going to do your directional options trade, make sure that they are... You're playing around with instruments that are above all three simple 50, 100, and 200 moving average lines. Ask any professional Wall Street trader, market maker, specialist, hedge fund, prop shop guy. They'll all tell you, yeah, use the 50, 100, and 200 SMAs. That's what we do. And you want to play around with charts that are up above all three unbroken moving average lines and then set up a trading plan up in the upper right side of the chart. Silver Wheaton, also a nice good breakout chart. Follow the yellow brick road. In this case, the silver road. It's above all three unbroken moving averages. What's significant is the increase in implied and actual recent historical volatility as it's gone up from a nice steady uptrend. Such a nice, well-mannered stock. And then boom, shakalaka. It's off to the races. And we got a high volume breakout in progress. So that makes sense to set uh, a, a buying a call or a series of call contracts up here with the strike up in the up in, the, up in the upper region here, a few points up above the current range. So those types of charts can really help keep you out of trouble. You know, it's something I think is missing from a lot of the options training that I've seen out there. And I certainly encourage you to learn from experts like Larry McMillan, who's the world's top expert, so he'd be a good guy to work with. Uh, make sure that you're learning from Larry, uh, learn from people like myself, uh, learn from others who know what they're, you know, what they're talking about and simplify your approach to trading, right? You know, one of the things that I think can help is, you know, from, for example, if for position sizing, you want to take your maximum risk per trade, maybe it's 2% of your, of your trading account, divide it by the number of contracts you want to buy. It's a function of implied volatility and the relative valuation of the premium, say one to 2% maximum. And you may want to buy multiple legs of contracts or trade across a sector. But one of the keys to success to trading is making sure that you have a segmented, intelligent approach where you're trading multiple instruments uh, and looking for strength within given sectors that are recently strong, like the airline sector or like gold has been or oil was back in March and April. Look for you know trades that make sense and make it work for you. So I'm about out of time here, but does that help? I wanted to kind of give you some clarity on the types of charts that can help you become more successful and 
trading options that are actually likely to hit your strike price versus fall short or do false breakouts. You know, these are prime cherry charts. These are all great charts. These I, I carefully scanned through is like 180 charts for you guys uh, this afternoon to visually pick out the best kind of the cherry pick best charts in the stock market. And this is them, right? This is the list. If my life depended on it, kind of like my favorite saying is the best way to become a diamond is get a lump of coal and a lot of pressure puts diamond, makes it into a diamond. I, I forgot who said that. I probably mangled that or like Nietzsche said, oh, it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. Well, Make it as though it's a do or die, life's on the line, what charts would you trade? And boil it down to a list of 10 or 15 that makes sense that can actually do well for you. Okay, so I hope that helps. One of the things, let me wrap up here, and I'll get Larry back on the line in just a minute. Look at which entry patterns to trade. Use a trading plan in terms of taking action that makes sense. And if you want to learn more with me, I've got 4,000 people in my weekly Saturday shindigs that uh, trading week ahead. We blaze through the best charts in 20 minutes. It's very high content quality. It's got to be because it's only 20 minutes. We have fun. We talk about the best charts, and you can register for free here, and that'll get you into the Saturday week ahead events. We're currently, uh, as of last Saturday, we had 4,000 people registered for those, so boom. Best in class, and great to see that. It's a real privilege to work with Larry McMillan. He's the top guy in this field in options. And so, uh, Larry, wanted to say thanks so much for being here. It's been an honor. I've been pursuing you for several years to, to do a webinar, and I appreciate your finally working with me because I know the best are always hard to get at, and I appreciate your taking time. And I heartily encourage all of my traders to explore Larry McMillan's offerings at optionstrategist.com. He's the go-to guy for options like Steve is for candles, so make sure you learn from Larry. And uh, Larry, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks, uh, Ken. I, I, I have one just piece of information. Uh, Karen in our office just told me that uh, we'll be emailing you the PDF <laughs> that you don't have to download it. But uh, so look for an email from us. Okay, that's good. And I will send out a link It'll it'll hit your email inbox in say six hours with the downloadable video version of this, and it'll be on my Amazon S3 server because we got so many of you here, 746 registered. So um, Larry, thanks a lot. I picked up a lot from you on the put call ratio and the VIX. Uh, it's uh, I had not known that about the VIX. So with so many of you here, I wanted to say, uh, put that up here. That's a really big number for a turnout for a, a summer webinar. So. Thanks, Larry. It's an honor to work with you. I only work with the best people, the best and the brightest, because I want traders to win. And they can't win by following all these internet marketer wannabe BS second class people that don't know what the heck they're talking about. You know, the people, they, they go to the source, they try and copy the source. And uh, that's those are not the people you want to learn from. You want to learn from the world's top experts, the world's top traders like Larry McMillan. So, uh, Larry, it's been an honor. And I really want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Ken. Thanks a lot. All right, well, traders, look for a email in your inbox with the downloadable video of this, and uh, we'll see you on the other side. So thanks so much, and best wishes for successful, profitable active trading as we move forward into what looks to be a very volatile trading year, which is great. We're not in a sleeper mode. We're in a good high-velocity market. So great time to be trading. Learn from Larry McMillan. Learn from myself, Ken Calhoun, and we'll see you inside our various members' areas and with our various services. So thanks so much. and uh, Thanks, uh, Larry. Any final words for our audience before we wrap up? Uh, this will be on the YouTube channel, too, so thousands will look at this in the years to come. So for posterity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for posterity. Overbought does not mean so. How's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's okay. uh, the words of wisdom. All right. Well, that'll work. All right. Well, thanks, Larry. Thanks so much, traders, for being here, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody. All right.